I've also spent some time uh, within the risk management and drought teams within the old Department of Primary Industries. Uh, I've spent a bit of time in Treasury on water reform and helped develop the Water Act 2000. Um, and also spent some time in the Department of Premier and Cabinet uh, in 2011 during the live export uh, crisis. Uh, in 2012, I moved into the private sector for around seven or eight years, uh, worked with Ag Force on a flood recovery contract uh, and managed the work health and safety, quality assurance and animal welfare uh, portfolio for AAMIG, um, so Agricultural Asset Management Investment Group, uh, and then spent some time uh, with them in, within MLA as the uh, Northern Beef Adoption Manager. Uh, other speakers that we've got on today, we've got a great uh, lineup of speakers. We've got Dave McRae. Dave's going to talk to us uh, about, a about the climate forecast moving forward and also the role of, uh, of local drought committees uh, and uh, types of assistance that are tied to drought declarations. Um, Jeff Bainish uh, from BAF is going to talk to us uh, about the farm business resilience uh, plan uh, and the requirements of a farm business resilience plan. Uh, I'd like people to pay particular attention to that because that really sets the scene for uh, the next uh, presenter, uh, who is Cherie Finney from Q Rider. Um, Cherie's going to talk to us uh, about um, the types of assistance that's now available under uh, under the new package through Q Rider. Uh, then we'll um, then we'll move into a presentation from John Coward, uh, and I'll introduce John later. Many of you would know John. John's been around for a number of years and today is representing QFF uh, and wears a number of different hats across, I think, the pork, poultry, um, what else, John, lot feeders, uh, and also um, the dairy sector as well. So I hope you've got some great questions. Um, as I've said, for those of you that have joined late, um, please utilise the Q&A function um, to post the questions and we'll get to those uh, in the Q&A session at the uh, just prior to closing. OK, so how do we get to where we are today? Um, so the purpose of today's webinar is to outline how people can apply for the new range of drought assistance measures. Uh, essentially, drought program review, I did a little bit of work on uh, on drought reform back in the late 90s, early 2000s. Um, and it'd be fair to say that we were very, very close to implementing um, some serious drought reform, apart from, I think, Chinchilla Shire from memory that was still drought declared and also a large number of IDPs in some other shires uh, back in the late 90s, early 2000s. Uh, the department uh, and industry groups have been through a number of drought reviews um, over the last few years, but the most significant one was undertaken in 2018, um, and it was uh, undertaken by Ruth Wade and uh, and Charles Burke uh, on behalf of the department. Uh, Ruth and Charles visited nine centres, I think, throughout regional Queensland and met with a range of producers to talk about uh, the current forms of drought assistance uh, and where drought reform should go. Uh, and a lot of the outcomes that we see today and we'll hear from presenters um, talking about today have directly come about uh, as a result of those meetings uh, and have been supported by industry. One of the more important things, I guess, is that while the current drought continues uh, and despite a lot of the uh, a lot of rainfall and flooding that we've experienced in southern and southeastern Queensland over the last month and um, even as recent as the last couple of days, I think on the Darling Downs, um, those there are areas in central Queensland and north Queensland and in the west um, that are still experiencing well below um, average summer rainfall. And Dave, uh, Dave McRae will highlight, uh, sorry, highlight that in his presentation. Those producers that are accessing the drought relief assistance scheme, so freight subsidies um, and other forms of assistance there will continue to be able to access that assistance for the period of the current drought. Uh, but we're here today to talk about the new assistance. So essentially Queensland's implementing the new drought assistance measures um, and the majority of those are going to be available through Q Rider and Cherie Finney from Q Rider will talk about those uh, different types of assistance 
the requirements of those and how you um, structure applications for those uh, in her presentation. Uh, for intensive animal industries, uh, the most important thing is that the range of assistance uh, now includes all primary producers across a, a broad range of agricultural industries. And the forms of assistance that, uh, that are now available really speak to uh, and encourage producers to build self-reliance in managing for drought. Uh, the other key thing about that is that producers will no longer need um, a drought declaration to access the drought preparedness assistance. So that's a, that's a key point of difference to the forms of assistance that are currently available through the Drought Relief Assistance Scheme. Uh, the key thing around accessing financial assistance under the new model is that producers will need to develop a farm business resilience plan. And as I said, Jeff Bainish from DAF will talk about that uh, a little bit later. Uh, that's enough from me, I guess, in terms of drought reform and how we got where we are today. Um, Dave, Dave McRae from DAF now uh, will talk a little bit about the current drought status, as I've just touched on, uh, and also provide a bit of a seasonal outlook um, for, I guess, the autumn and winter period. Uh, many of you would know Dave. Uh, he's um, does a lot of work uh, and is well publicised. Uh, he's got an extensive work history uh, within the Department in Climate Science, and he's been working with producers to manage their climate risks for a number of years. Uh, over the last few years, as the State Climate Risk Coordinator, Dave's been involved in the drought declaration process, um, as well as uh, assisting in uh, the drought relief assistance scheme uh, and reviewing applications there. Uh, Dave tells me that he's very much in, he lives on the downs and he's very much enjoying uh, the rainfall that they've had up there and uh, and looking out his window and seeing a bit of green grass. So welcome, Dave. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, thanks, Ted, and thank you everyone for the opportunity to be here today. First of all, I just thought I'd start on the uh, current drought status, where we are under state government processes. The map that you see in front of you there is just off the Long Paddock website. The link to the maps down the bottom of the page there. It's a really good site to go and have a look around and play around and see what's in there. It's uh, quite a large amount of climate related information. Come back to the topic. Uh, so this is the current Queensland drought situation as of today. Uh, currently, there's 64.7% of the land area of the state declared. That comprises 34 fully declared local government areas and three part declared local government areas. Those part ones are Flinders, Isaac and Whitsunday. There's also further 25 individually droughted properties in a further seven local government areas. So those areas are, are ones that are not drought declared and they're predominant. Those IDPs are predominantly in the far northwest. So in terms of when do we review this type of pro, uh, product or when do we review the uh, draft declarations, key time for that is coming out now during April. Uh, we use April as a time to review it because that's at the end of the spring and summer rainfall season. You know, the uh, have a good idea of how much soil water there is, how much surface water for livestock, how much irrigation water there is, how much pasture is grown, etc. Like that, what livestock condition there is, is there a large scale movement of livestock for drought related uh, issues, etc. So if you're going to see any changes to this type of map, uh, they'll occur over the next one to two months. Uh, in terms of uh, local drought committees, they comprise primary producers from the different regions within that area, and those primary producers represent those industries. Um, so if we go to the next map here, uh, Ted mentioned before the uh, review of drought processes, I think it was undertaken in 2018-19. One of the outcomes or re recommendations of that report was to produce a more tailored product to identify areas of risk or, as I also like to point out, areas of opportunity or where things are going well uh, for the state. So based on research, uh, they developed a product that combines rainfall, soil moisture, evapotranspiration and satellite imagery of greenness. Uh, and they use that to produce a tailored index. Uh, the map that you can see there is the combined drought indicator uh, through to the end of February this year, and it takes into account what's occurred over the last 24 months. As you can see, over the last uh, 24 months, the southern parts of the state have done reasonably well, while parts of central and central west have not done quite as well. So look, the link to that site's there. It's a really good uh, site to go and have a look around it. If you wanted to have a look around uh, Australia, 
to Australia as a whole and see what's occurring. Uh, the products are there. There's the CDI one. There's ones based on just rainfall and temperature. There's other ones based on extreme. So it's a good place to go and have a look to get a grasp of what's happening. While the changes in, uh, well, with this process, uh, drought is being wound back as areas come off drought declarations or people self-revoke so they can actually access the new scheme themselves. I would just like to point out that there is still a large amount of uh, assistance available to primary producers who are suffering the negative impacts of drought. And those are presented by other departments, not necessarily DAF, but departments such as Regional Development, Manufacturing and Water, Department of Resources, Department of Transport and Main Roads, and federal and state government funding for things such as uh, weed and pest animal control, etc. So a couple of key ones that I do know that people uh, do like to take access to is that Drought Relief from Electricity Charges Scheme, DREX, that's run through your local power provider. The land rent rebates and water license waivers. Both of those schemes are well utilised by uh, irrigators, especially and certainly in intensive livestock areas where people may have to irrigate a lot. Um, there's other ones such as the vehicle registration concessions, etc., like that. So, look, if people are still uh, being impacted negatively by drought, I encourage them to go to the Business Queensland website. There's quite a list of support that's there, and for people to have a look at it and see what's available that may suit them. And just to finish off, uh, I just thought I'd put up the uh, Bureau of Meteorology's outlook through to the end of, uh, through to the end of June this year. So the map shows here is just a chance of getting above median rainfall for April, May, June. Basically for most of Queensland, you're talking about a 60% upwards chance of getting above median rainfall over those three months. Uh, for the southeast and parts of the uh, Eastern third of the state, that's a bit higher around that 70, 75%. Some people in the southeast of the state, and especially for northeast New South Wales, that may not be the greatest piece of news you've seen, but certainly for other people in central Queensland, you know, I'll be hoping that it may provide a better start to the autumn winter season than what they may have experienced over the last six months. Uh, but that's it for me. Thank you very much for your time, and I'll be here for questions if anyone uh, has anything they want. Um, query. Thank you. Good on you, Dave. Thank you very much. So for those of you that have just joined, I've seen a few people have uh, joined during Dave's presentation. Uh, if you're used to using Teams, uh, you probably have posed questions before in the chat function. Um, we're not using the chat function today. We're using the Q&A function. So please post any questions you have in the Q&A function. OK. Uh, any questions for Dave, as I said, please uh, post them in the chat there. Um, Jeff Bainish now will talk to us about the Farm Business Resilience Plan. Uh, Jeff commenced in the role of Program Manager for the Farm Business Resilience Program within DAF, uh, the Drought Policy and Response Team, uh, in January of this year. And prior to this, he was the Facility Manager of the ex-Queensland Ag Training Assets in Emerald. Welcome, Jeff. Thanks very much for joining us today. Thanks, Ted, and thanks very much for the opportunity to be here today. So if I could just get you to have a look at this, the slide there and imagine that it's dairy cows grazing Kikuya pastures. Um, a bit more appropriate for this uh, webinar and the topic of intensive livestock. So when we're talking about farm business resilience plan, it's important to recognise and acknowledge, as Ted mentioned, that the Farm Business Resilience Plan is a critical document that underpins the whole drought reform uh, agenda and the change in philosophy from um, reactive responses to drought towards a more proactive re approach to being more prepared and resilient to drought. So a Farm Business Resilience Plan is required uh, for applications to participate in the new drought packages that Sheree will be talking about shortly. So a farm business resilience plan is a plan that shows where the producer wants their operation to be in the future and how they'll manage the risks their business will face. So the plan identifies goals and assesses strategies and plans to manage risks such as drought. So I think it's important to emphasise that we can't control everything and um, weather is certainly one of the things that we, we can't control. 
there are some pretty good tools now to forecast, but um, we're pretty much dependent on what Mother Nature brings us. So the farm business resilience planning process is really about um, planning and taking action for those things that we can control. So we've got a fair idea about um, some of the events that might happen in the future. So the planning process in, it allows us to put in place um, production systems and strategies that will help us be more resilient in the event that um, those events occur. So it provides a real focus on those things that we can control uh, as opposed to those things that Mother Nature throws at us. So I'll just go quickly through what's included in a farm business resilience plan. So as a first point, prior to completing the farm business resilience plan, uh, we've created some self-assessment checklists. So they're available on the DAF drought website. So the self-assessment checklists provide businesses with a template that they can go through and it pretty much conducts a pretty thorough situation analysis uh analyzing the full spectrum where the business is now um, and helps to identify those areas where um, there's there are risks that currently aren't being managed um, and to align the strategies within the business plan with where the business wants to go in the future so first step is a farm business self-assessment checklist um, which is a precursor to completing a farm business resilience plan. So the farm business resilience plan uh, has a number of themes. So the first theme is about our business. So it's a descriptive um, section which provides the background. So I'll just go through a little case study. I think it's a really good example. Um, forgive me that it's not related to intensive production uh, animal production, but it is one that I think we can all identify with. So in terms of this little scenario I'll talk about, uh, the business is a horticultural business that has about 400 hectares of irrigated horticultural production in southeast Queensland, um, producing mainly small crops. So the theme two uh, is our motivation. So that's where you said about what what your overall reason for being in business is. So in this case, it's a multi-generational business. Um, they want to create a business that is going to provide for their family and their, their children's ch children. Um, they probably want to leave the land in a better position than they found it in. Um, and they want to be able to do this with a reasonable level of comfort. So they want to achieve a reasonable standard of living um, in order to do that. So theme three, our goals. So in terms of the goals, they might have really specific goals in relation to each of the areas. So production goals, um, natural resource goals, business goals and personal goals. So it's probably not appropriate to talk about individuals goals but uh, goal setting is incredibly powerful and I think we've all experienced that um, and it's important to do it in a holistic way so you know don't get too focused on one area hence uh, the range of areas that goals are uh, represented in this plan. In terms of managing risks this business through their um, situation analysis they identified that a critical factor or a critical limitation in their business and the major risk was was climate and in particular it's dependent on an underground water source so the aquifer that's recharged episodically and as as it gets drier uh, both the water quality and the water quantity declines so where you have 400 hectares of prime uh, horticultural land um, it pretty much is reduced to dry land broad acre cropping in some periods where the water quality and quantity declines. So that's a, that was a significant risk and it's identified as a significant li limiting factor for that business. 
So in terms of managing their risks, in the past they used to change crops. So they change crops from horticultural crops to dry land crops. They grow crops that are more susceptible or more water efficient and less susceptible to salt, because as the quality of the water declines, the amount of salt that they were putting on um, increased. So they needed more salt tolerant crops. So that was the previous strategy, in addition to probably utilising more efficient water irrigation techniques. So they were the previous strategies uh, in terms of managing dry conditions, which is theme five. Theme six, our new actions and implementation to improve the business. So given that in that case, uh, water was seen as the main limiting factor, not much you can do about the quantity and quality of water. So one action could be to put in a, a water storage and pump so that pump for longer periods to enable some irrigation to take place. Um, so that's one strategy. And an alter alternative strategy that was investigated was putting in place a uh, controlled environment greenhouse. So combined with a reverse osmosis desalination plant. So that enabled them, this business, to continue to operate um, even when the water quality and quantity declined to the point that they couldn't otherwise operate. Um, it had also, so from a drought resilience perspective, it enabled them to continue to operate, even given the, the limited resources that they had. Um, some other side benefits from that is it enabled them to produce high value crops out of season. Um, it enabled them to utilise that limited resource much more efficiently. So there, there are a whole lot of side benefits associated with um, making that change. And then theme seven uh, is reviewing our plan. So basically, in that case, uh, I suspect that they found that the technology was quite different and the production practices required to run a hydroponic enterprise were quite different to their traditional practices. And so um, in a review of the plan, they they decided that they needed to get additional input and they employed someone who had experience with those systems. Um, they also had to review their marketing plans and, and what product they were growing when. So overall, I think that case study highlights how one business has had a look at their production system, um, had a look at the critical living resources, determined that they're highly susceptible to drought and the variable climate and has taken some action. So it's just one example. So in result, they ended up being more drought resilient, but had a whole lot of other benefits associated with pr producing higher market value crops, out of season, um, etc. So I hope you can identify with that and, and apply some of the things that that business went through to some other case studies or, or to other situations. So in terms of completing a plan, there are a number of ways that producers can uh, get assistance or to complete a plan. So they can attend one of the Farm Business Resilience Project workshops and get assistance from the Farm Business Resilience Program. Um, so there are six main programs and a number of sub programs. So there's about 15 organisations currently involved in presenting and John Coward is going to talk about the QFF Farm Business Resilience Project um, shortly, which is relevant to the intensive agricultural industries. Uh, people might have an existing plan. So if, if producers already have an existing plan that meets the minimum requirements of the Farm Business Resilience Plan template, there's no problems using an existing plan. They may also have a much more comprehensive plan. Um, another option is to seek advice from a consultant to provide assistance to develop a farm management, a farm business resilience plan. Um, or alternatively, you can do it yourself. Uh, and there are some tools available. 
So some of the resources that are available to assist with developing a farm business resilience plan. Um, as I said, the farm business resilience plan industry projects. So there are six main ones and a number of sub projects. And QFF is the project that's specifically related to intensive agricultural industries, in addition to the dairy program, which is focused specifically on the dairy industry. Uh, there are self-assessment checklists to complete the uh, situation analysis where we are now. So they're located on the DAF website and some of the industry projects have also developed self-assessment checklists and farm business resilience plan templates that are more appropriate for those industries. There are fact sheets, videos and other explanatory material on the DAF website. So DAF qld.gov.au forward slash drought. So that's about it for the Farm Business Resilience Plan. But as I said, it's a critical document that underpins the whole philosophy of the, the drought reform agenda. So back to you, Ted. Good on you, Jeff. Thank you very much. A great presentation, mate. So it uh, a lot to take in, everyone, I know. Um, and that's what the beauty of having the Q&A session at the end. Uh, for those of you that just joined us, uh, please utilise the Q&A function to post any questions that you may have, uh, and the panel session will deal with those when we get to the end of the presentation. As Jeff uh, indicated, uh, we'd now have John Coward, um, who will talk about the Farm Business Resilience Program. Uh, John spent 30 years as a stock and meat inspector, a bit like myself, John, um, and was also the senior manager of, uh, or a senior manager within um, Queensland Safe Food Authority. Uh, John took up a position as managing director of Swickers, um, the pork abattoir at Kingaroy there, uh, and the position included um, a role as a chairman of a three and a half thousand sow piggery, um, and also uh, a role in um, multiple contract farms to grow out the pigs. Um, after retiring from full-time work, John took up two representative uh, positions supporting the pork and egg industry uh, and their producers in Queensland uh, as the CEO and president of those industries. So as I indicated earlier, John also is uh, putting on a number of hats today, and he's also wearing, a, on behalf of QFF, wearing a dairy and a, and a chicken meat producer's hat as well. So welcome, John. Look forward to hearing your thoughts, I guess, on uh, on the Farm Business Resilience Program and how producers can uh, really target uh, assistance and utilise the program moving forward, mate. Good, thanks, Ted, and um, thanks to the previous speakers. Um, look. I want to speak, I'm not going to put a presentation up, I'm going to just speak straight from my heart about the value of this. And I'm thinking that this project uh, and webinar is going to go out to a lot of producers. So we're um, in this role today to be speaking to you, the producers out there and in our industries that are impacted, our intensive industries that are impacted by drought. Significantly different, we know, than the extensive industries. However, what I wanted to uh, talk to you about and give you a couple of ideas are the values of those uh, plans, the Farm Business Resilience Plan. I've got to let you know that uh, under QFF, great organisation, cross-representation across extensive and, and, and um, intensive industries, and Kerry Battersby is the project manager. So in contact to QFF, that would be one of the sources through Kerry Battersby, the project manager for the resilience program. The other one is to come directly through to one of the industry representatives, pork, chicken meat, eggs. Um, and as we know, dairy are doing their own thing. So that's fine. The thing I wanted to point out was the value of the planning and the risk identification. So as a producer, I go around and I talk to the small, medium and large producers that are, um, I'm representing. And look, the big end of town has probably got well-documented plans. One of the things I've found is sometimes they don't review those plans early enough and that causes some issues. The smaller family farm that's progressive uh, are probably more reactive. 
and their planning strategies tend to be in their head. And I think this is the perfect opportunity for producers who think they know what to do when those emergencies come, the drought, the drought resilience planning, um, that when those occasions come, then there's too many other things on their table. So what I would say is this farm business resilience planning provides you with the opportunity to address things while you're not stressed. Because one of the things I get when I go around the farms or talk to them on the phone, I say, what is it's keeping you up at night? And you'll just get the list. And strangely enough, that's the list of things that you need to think about, particularly when they're aligned to drought, to put into your farm business resilience. It's not just about when it's drought time. It can be when it's other times you need to borrow loans to do work on your farm. You may want to address the drought issues and put water storage on your farm. But most of the time in our uh, intensive industries, it's about our food supply for the animals, grain. And invariably, your livestock, as you know, are not impacted by the drought. They're impacted by the inability to get grain or at least grain at a reasonable price. So putting that information on paper to a plan, what you're going to do about it, starts to make sense, especially when you're under the pressure. So the types of things that QFF through Kerry or myself and other uh, intensive livestock member uh, reps, uh, what we offer is a conduit back into the DAF and the Q Rider programs. Fantastic what they've done in including more comprehensively the intensive industries. And while it may seem complex and complicated to you as a producer to take this planning exercise on, let me just announce that QFF and my industry organisations that we represent are here to support both the Curida plans and the DAF support that sit behind it. And collectively, I think um, we provide the producers a linkage through to DAF and uh, QRider and hopefully an easier pathway for you to understand. So look, um, that's probably the key thing that I wanted to say. Um, the plan is not just for now. A, a good plan should consist of multiple areas, drought resilience. It should consist of succession planning. It should consist of financial analyses. So in building your plan, thinking about those things is what we can help you uh, address uh, that Jeff identified in the plans. There are some platforms there. Come together. You can go through DAF Direct. You can go through QRider Direct. But QFF op offers that opportunity for you, the producer, to come through us, talk one-on-one. -on -one. We understand your business. We understand what you talk about when you say, yeah, but the grain is not in Queensland. It's not even in New South Wales now. I'm getting it from Perth and the cost has gone through the roof. So we can help you address those things and put strategies in place to um, have a successful plan and have a successful application. So look, Ted, um, I'll, I'll leave it at that and uh, come back in the question an answer time, uh, Q&A time, and um, I think uh, if any producers out there uh, want to talk to an industry person specifically, come through the QFF uh, site. The information will be provided at the end of this webinar in, in the uh, linkages. So uh, look forward to hearing from you out there that need some support uh, for this fantastic uh, farm resilience program and help you develop some plans. Thank you very much. All the best. Good on you, John. Thank you very much. Uh, it just for people on the webinar today, it just shows you the level of support um, that is out there to help you uh, get your head around not only the program of work, but also how to develop a plan. Um, so please, if you've got any questions, uh, haven't got any up yet, uh, pop them into the Q&A function there. Uh, John, but certainly after your presentation, I've got a, a question that uh, either you or Jeff can uh, respond to, I'm sure. Okay, moving along. Uh, 
I'd now like to introduce uh, Cherie Finney. Cherie is going to talk to us today about uh, the assistance measures that are available um, through Q Rider. Uh, Cherie, for her sins, is the <laughs> is the manager of natural disasters and drought, so she's got a pretty big portfolio at the moment, uh, and has been with Q Rider since April 2019. Uh, prior to her life in Q Rider, she was an agribusiness credit uh, analyst with a commercial bank, and prior to that, was the manager for Good Shepherd Microfinance. Uh, in this role, she administered and delivered microfinance and financial inclusion to disadvantaged people. Uh, Cherie loves dogs, otters, uh, and scuba diving, and is passionate about helping people. So, she's uh, she certainly got a job ahead of her in a current role. Uh, welcome, Cherie. Thank you very much for joining us today. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm just going to pull up my my pictures here, and then we can go from here. So, um, drought support. Let's have a quick chat. So um, you all got, you guys all know who we are. We're Curider. A couple of the things that we do provide are actually up on your screen at the moment. Hopefully you can see that. Um, you know, first start loan sustainability loans, of course, the disaster recovery, which is my shit at the moment. Uh, Cherie, it hasn't come up yet. Oh, okie dokie, let's go back. Let's try again. I'm sorry, everybody. My share function is not working, M. <laughs> Technology, it's, it's a great, it's isn't it? Own. If we've got a plan B, yeah. M. We do have carry a plan on B. Train, I'll bring it okay. Up. All right. I'll I'll just carry on. So um you obviously don't see it on there, but um the what we do and who we are, I'm just gonna skip over that. I'm gonna go straight to the farm management grants. So um, as Jeff and John really beautifully ill, like, you know, reiterated that um, the co like the keystone of this entire program is that farm business resilience plan. So um, what the farm management grants do is al allow primary producers a 50% rebate up to a maximum of $2,500 to get it professional advice to help them produce that farm business resilience plan. Um, so what, you know, that, that um, I guess, I'm, I'm not gonna reiterate what the, what the gentlemen have already said about the importance of the plan and what the plan does, but getting advice from all of those different places, you know, your accountant, a solicitor, an agronomist, uh, even you know, a marketing expert, um, all of those workplace health and safety things, all of that stuff that they were discussion, um, succession planning, everything. So not just not just about the drought is what you need to get you know um, your head around when you're talking about the farm the, the farm business resilience plan. Of course, it's a really important element of it, but there's so much else involved. So you know, like the the emphasis is that you know don't just um, you know don't just get advice from one place. You can get you know multiple um, amounts of advice. Up to two thousand five hundred dollars can be rebated. So. Um, that's, you know, I guess the one thing that I really, you know, stress people, get the advice, go around, go to several different places and it really does encourage people to do that. Then you can go and, you know, produce the farm business resilience plan yourself, get assistance, go to the workshops, talk to the guys at QFF that can help you out with those things as well. Um, and then, you know, put in that put in that grant for that small amount of money that comes that, that you, you know, you've outlaid and then get 50% back. Um, I'll just grab the next slide, please, Emma, sorry. So eligibility for it, um, it's you have to be a primary producer defined in the guidelines. It's somebody that derives 50% of their gross income from that primary production entity and spends more than 50% of their total labour on farm. Um, you have to have paid for the professional advice. So what when, when you apply, through us, you pop um, your your application form as well as the invoice and proof of that payment. You have to have received that professional advice after 11th of November 2021. It can't be prior to that because that's when these grants opened. Um, and then um, that person that you receive the eligible advice from can't be yourself. You can't, you know, you can't pay yourself for the advice can't have uh, any conflict of interest, can't be an owner within the business or a partnership or, or a 
a close relative and cannot be employed by the entity or partly owned. Um, next one. So we're going to briefly talk about um, this is the one that everyone wants to talk about the um, drought preparedness grant. Now I will revisit this after I um, well, after we go through the slides because I will actually chat not quite a case study like what Jeff sort of talked about, but um, maybe I guess some of the decline reasons that we would be seeing or you know a couple of just a couple of little things like that. But the drought preparedness grant, so it's a grant of up to fifty thousand dollars. Um, or 25% as a co-contribution to an activity to carry out one of the permanent on-farm capital improvements that is part of that Farm Business Resilience Plan. So when we look at the Farm Business Resilience Plan, theme five, which was how can we manage dry conditions and drought, and theme six was the new actions and the implementation of that plan to improve your business around drought. That's what we look at. So really that correlation between the proposed works that you put into the grant plus um, what's in that FBRP and it, it relating to drought preparedness is kind of what we look at around this drought preparedness grant. Drought preparedness grant. Um, so $50,000 Oh, up to fifty thousand dollars, and that doesn't—you don't have to spend it in one. You can have several activities within your FBRP that um, you know you, you could potentially go for you know more than one, up to fifty thousand dollars in a five-year time frame. So um, it really does, you know, some really good examples of um, you know what those sorts of things could be. It could be used for pipes, water tanks, all of that irrigation, water troughs, dam. Um, dam construction, brand new dam construction um, or expansion of an existing dam, uh, drilling for a new working bore, uh, water conservation infrastructure and equipment, um, so like uh, like more efficient irrigation, water pumps, solar power supplies used within those water pumps, storage, mixing and feeding out equipment for grain fodder, molasses and other supplements is an eligible activity. Um, so um, grain storage equipment and then improves the ability of that business to manage drought. Um, but then what it can't be used for is things like salaries and wage expenses, motor vehicles, um, a dry hire of machinery, of your own machinery, um, replacement, repair or, um, or you know, um, improvement to existing infrastructure. Um, it, you can't use it for, um, you know, funding or conducting any feasibility studies or um, costs associated with drilling of dry bores or test bores and it cannot be involved with restructuring or refinancing any existing loan products. The existing Queensland, uh, the Q Rider sustainability loan can be used as the co-contribution grant. Um, it can also cover um, any freight or contractor costs that are involved in the installation of that infrastructure. Um, can I grab the next slide, please, Emma? Okay, so um, the to, to be eligible, let's have a look. We've got the must and the must nots. So demonstrate at least one person. So you have to be a primary producer, that 50% gross income, as well as the um, more than 50% of your total labor involved in the, um, the primary production enterprise. You have to demonstrate an ability to provide the remaining contribution. So because it's a co-contribution, you should you have to prove where the rest of the money is coming from. Like a perfect example would be a two hundred thousand dollar project. Uh, Fifty thousand dollars comes from up. Fifty thousand dollars comes from the Q Rider Drought Preparedness Grant, and the other hundred and fifty comes from a uh, commercial bank, the sustainability loan, one of the other drought loans that are in all your own money. What whichever way that comes in, you just have to show that that just demonstrate where that's coming from. You also have to have the necessary approvals. So if you're going to put a dam in or erect a shed, we actually need to see the approvals for that. And then you do need to present a satisfactory farm business resilience plan. Like I um, uh, explained that theme five and that theme six is obviously what we um, focus on, but the farm business resilience plan does need to be put in as part of the application and it does need to be satisfactory and complete. Um, you cannot, so when we move on to the what you what would deem you ineligible, you can't um, have made an application um, 
for the DRAS funding within the last six month period for any assistance. So that's the freight, freight subsidy, the emergency water re um, rebate, anything under the DRAS scheme. And um, you cannot have pre previously received a drought preparedness grant for the same activity, the same the same project. So which um, it's, it's a, it is only fifty thousand dollars, but um, you can apply more than once in a five year plan, uh, five year period up to fifty thousand uh, dollars. Next, please. Can I grab the next slide, please? Oh, sorry, drought, carry on finance loans. Sorry about this. So we've got three loans now that um, are available through the drought package. We've got the drought carry on finance loan and an emergency drought loan, which is all part of um, that uh, when you're when you're suffering the effects mm. of um, drought. So the drought carry on finance loan is two hundred fifty up to two hundred fifty thousand dollars, and it's affected by drought for your carry on finance or your uh, working capital expenses. So you can use this for employee wages, you can use it for pay, paying creditors or your rates or lease payments or, um, you know, anything that carries on the business in, in that capacity. Um, next, please, Em. So eligibility, again, you do have to be a primary producer. So that 50% um, gross income and 50% of your labour mm. needs to be put on there. You have to, for this particular loan, you do have to have carried on the primary production business for at least 12 months, which is similar to what the DRAS funding was at, in, in that respect. You do have to um, demonstrate that you can service the loan. There is a security element of that, but that's sort of as part of the application, we do go through that in a more depth in basis and we, we discuss that. Um, we do. Um, you need to just. You need to demonstrate that the primary production business can't support the carry on existing from other liquid assets. So you know we do require that a farm, like an FMD, does need to be utilised, and um, you know over current overdraft uh, limits do need to be utilised. And then that farm business resilience plan, which once again is that keystone to this entire program. Um, because currently being in drought, we do understand that drought carry on finance loans would be potentially for somebody that hasn't completed a farm business resilience plan, but a, satisf a satisfactory one will need to be provided within a reasonable time period after application for this particular loan. And the drought rent, well, you're all over it, the drought ready and recovery finance loan. This one here is um, something that a, a producer could use as their co-contribution for the for the drought preparedness grant. It's up to $250,000 um, to undertake ready and recovery activities to improve drought resilience in your business. So again, you have to demonstrate that your primary production, 50 and 50 again, and the project for this particular loan has to be outlined in your farm business resilience plan. It has to be part of that um, theme six, the new actions and implementation that um, you know will improve your business's ability to um, you know be resilient through drought or dry spells. You have to have um, prospects for viability and the uh, um, you know the ability to service that loan. Once again, the security is required, and um, so demonstrate for drought recovery finance or replanting or restocking it has to you know that has to be part of the plan and it has to be satisfactory it can't just be um you know you you, you do need to sort of explain where you're going from that that farm business resilience plan needs to be put in for this particular loan as part of the application on to the next one um now this one here is a, an emergency drought assistance loan. Now this is a smaller loan. This is for fifty thousand um, dollars, and this is for people that um, are for businesses that are affected by drought. It is once again for your carry on or your essential working capital needs, but it's a lot smaller. Um, can be used again for you know wages, creditors, lease agreement payments, rates you know, all of those sorts of things, um, but it is significantly smaller. However, this one is completely interest free. It is um, for seven years as opposed to the other two loans, which are up to 10 years, and they do have a concessional rate attached to them. This one is interest free and it also has a two year repayment holiday. So this is, um, a you know, a, a 
I, I guess, a much more gentle approach to um, having a loan, given the fact that you, know, you don't have to pay it back for two years and um, there's never any interest going to be applied. Mm. Um, on to the next one. Again, for the eligibility, um, it, it's 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 almost it's it, they're mm. all very similar in the eligibility sense, except that you know the only real difference is the emergency drought loan and the carry on loan. That farm business resilience plan we understand may not come along with the application because you're actually suffering the effect, effects of drought, but we do require it moving forward into. Um, yeah, within a reasonable time frame. I have been asked what a reasonable time frame is. Um, it's not, you know, 30 days or 90 days. We, every one of these loans do actually have a yearly review. So every year we sit down with your, um, you know, you have a portfolio manager and they chat to you about, you know, how you're going and you put forward your financials and, and um, income tax returns and things like that. Um, and we would expect that prior to the first year review, we would have received a satisfactory farm business resilience plan from the applicants. Um, pop onto the next slide, please. So this one here is just about how to find us. We've got 11 regions throughout Queensland and the, each region has um, a regional area manager and it's really easy to find them and they are all amazing people and really easy to talk to. You can jump on our website, so qrider.qld.gov.au and then there's a section that's your region. It's pretty easy to find and you just pop your postcode in the, in the little search button and um, those details of that person, a little blurb about who they are, where they come from, their phone number, their email address, all of that will pop up and then you can contact the regional area manager very, very easily. Um, pop on to the next one. The next one here is um, don't, the biggest message from this one is actually point two, don't self-assess regarding the eligibility. Just talk, talk to us, ring us, go through QFF, ring DAF, ring us, just talk to us about it. Um, you can contact us at any time on 1800 623 946 and there is a team there always willing and able to help you. Um, that is me for my slide project, but what I was going to just touch on really briefly is the, the, um, the drought preparedness grant has been open for a little while and there, you know, are a number of, I think, I think the most um, powerful thing that I can help you with and explain to you is what those decline reasons would be and what the, what, what we're coming through. So really number one reason would be that the farm business resilience plan has not been acceptable it's not been to a satisfactory level either you know it's not complete it's inadequate there's only a couple of sections that have been filled out not the entire thing um, or it's written prescriptively and what i mean by that is because it is such an important part to this entire program and the, the way that, um, you know, Jeff was saying that there are so many benefits from doing, uh, you know, an, a, a satisfactory farm business resilience plan, having those just written because you wanted to access a grant um, is, you know, th that's not really beneficial for the business as a whole. So something, you know, within that, having things that are measurable, that are specific, the time frames that are, you know, like that are really specific. Um, we've seen a couple that they, um, they have at application haven't pro, you know produced their financials or shown their income tax returns to we, we haven't been able to assess whether they would be considered primary production under the, the guidelines of this particular scheme. We've seen um, the purchases for what they're doing have already been made. So under the under the drought preparedness grant, any activity that you're doing cannot be started until you've received an approval. So um, we have to we have had to decline um, uh, applications because the purchases have already been made or the work has already been started. Um, uh, also, replacing existing infrastructure. So if they're just um, you, you know, they've, they've got an existing hay shed that they wanted to, you know, replace um, rather than expand or put a new one, um, we would have to decline them on that. No clear drought mitigation strategy. So theme six, our new actions and implementations plan to to um, to improve the business in that in that farm business resilience plan wasn't clear. It didn't make sense, or it wasn't comprehensive enough, or it was, you know, a little. There, there was just, um, you know. It, it, you know, potentially they have five or six activities that all expand on top top of one another and to get a big picture we understand that that is a really big clear drought mitigation strategy 
but the FBR, the, the Farm Business Resilience Plan that they put forward as part of the drought preparedness grant only showed activity one and it made no sense for a bigger mitigation strategy or um, lacking correlation between the proposed works and the preparedness grant application and the Farm Business Resilience Plan. So they, I think, are um, the decline reasons that we've had. And I think that that's a really powerful tool to realise what not to do when you're going forward. Part of your um, just realising that that Farm Business Resilience Plan is really the most important element of this entire program. And I guess that the, the not so much the, the emergency loans or the carry on loans, because you're already in drought for that, but that, um, you know, that the, the ready and recovery and that drought preparedness grant are really just the cherry on top to make those um, you know, theme six, the, the new actions and implementing those a reality. Um, thanks so much for having me. Um, I will be back later on for the Q&As. Good on you, Cherie. Thank you very much. Participants, there's a lot of information there that Cherie's covered in, a, in quite a short space of time. Um, that's not her fault. She's got a job to do and it's a difficult one. Um, but hopefully that's going to prompt a few questions from you. Uh, for those people that have joined late, uh, again, and if you're operating off a phone or an iPad, uh, and you want to ask a question, you've got to utilise the Q&A function. Um, so go to the bottom of your screen uh, and select the three dots, and then um, you should come up or you should see there um, the Q&A function there. Uh, we had a few issues. Uh, we ran a webinar yesterday with the extensive livestock sector, and we had a few issues with people not being able to ask questions because they were operating uh, iPads or iPhones. Um, so if you've got any issues, uh, certainly hopefully that uh, clarity that I've just provided will enable you to ask some questions. Uh, we've got some great questions coming through. Uh, we're just about to get to the Q&A session. Um, but just to recap uh, essentially on what we've heard today, uh, there's three main tiers to uh, the new drought reform package moving forward. Uh, there's the drought preparedness, uh, once you're in drought and then a period of drought recovery. And um, as we've heard from our speakers today, uh, when you're in drought preparedness, uh, there are a number, the Farm Business Resilience Plan is central and critical uh, to being able to access assistance, such as the Farm Management Grant, Preparedness Grants, and then those uh, ready and recovery loans. Uh, once you're in drought, uh, there's two types of assistance there, the emergency drought assistance loan and the drought carry on loan. And then when you enter that period of drought recovery, uh, there is that drought ready uh, and recovery loan. So hopefully that just provides a little bit of clarity, um, gives you a little bit of uh, uh, certainty, I guess, in terms of moving forward. Uh, but in reality, it's a there's a three step process um, for this and it's outlined there. So step one, uh, develop your farm business resilience plan. And we've heard today from all of our speakers that essentially you don't have to do this yourself. You can do it if you feel confident in, in being able to develop the plan, um, but there is a range of assistance out there. And John has beautifully uh, clarified that, um, particularly through QFF. Uh, there's a range of uh, providers that can assist you through that journey. Uh, if you want to engage someone, uh, a consultant or whatever, um, there is assistance available uh, to be able to help you meet the costs of, or 50% of the cost associated with that. Uh, so the next step is there is to uh, familiarise yourself with the guidelines uh, and review the different types of assistance that is available to you. There is a range. Uh, of assistance there. And then the third step is to make sure that you uh, lodge an application. Uh, and in terms of lodging the application and developing a farm business resilience plan, it's all around the quality of the application and the uh, and the information that you put into it. OK, I think we're uh, I think we're ready to go uh, for our Q&A session. So all of our speakers today are available um, to answer your questions. Uh, we've got a number of great questions that have uh, that have come in. Um, 
so we might just get into those. We're getting uh, getting close to uh, or running to time pretty well. Uh, first question for you, John, if that's OK. Uh, See, I'm not on screen, but I No, I that's can... that's OK. We can hear you, mate. That's um, that's what we need to. Uh, that's what we need to hear. So yep. essentially the question is, in your opinion, how does a farm business resilience plan help mate, moving forward? How is it going to help your business? Um, look, I think first of all, Ted, to answer that, the intensives are significantly different. And from a producer, uh, producers that are out there across eggs, pork, chicken, meat in particular, um, our impact is the grain, the feed. It makes 60% roughly of the diet. And generally, in a drought condition, our intensive livestocks are invariably not within the drought area, as I've mentioned before. So I think how that F, uh, B, FBRP can help is by making it part of the analysis. Um, where I see it, the, the FBRP, Farm Business Resilience Plan, it's the resilience that we want to talk about. The things that it does for me, and I want to tell the, talk to the producers about this, if you do it and it comes out of your head and you get it onto paper and, it be, and it's done through the application process, you will identify your risks. You'll put them on paper. You'll consider those impacts. It introduces the actions that you need to do to address those issues. And once you start putting it down on paper and document that, it will demonstrate the actions that you need to do to make your farm more resilient, more resilient to drought, more resilient to market impacts, more resilient to the problem you have in getting grain from overseas or South Australia or Western Australia. And I think it's very much linked to the markets because our intensive livestock industry is not uh, the same as those where supply and demand influence the market price. Market price for us is the same, irrespective of whether you're in drought or not. It's not about uh, the, the, the impacts of that feed. It's about whether or not the market is uh, in, in demand or, or under supply or oversupply. And in our intensive livestock industries, as we all know, you just can't stop the process. With pigs, you've got three months running through the process. With chicken meat, you've got seven weeks worth of process and you just can't turn it off. So building a farm business resilience plan, I think is just one of the greatest things that you can do. Get it out of your head and get it onto paper. Make that application for it. And as I said before, um, even the big guys who've got plans, this is the time to review it. Many of them have got business continuity plans, and I think here's the opportunity to apply for a farm business resilient plan and include it in your business continuity plan. Sorry for the long answer. Yeah, no, that, yeah good, yeah. great response. Thank you, John. And it, and it leads me on to a question I think that, uh, that probably Jeff can answer. Um, so essentially, in your opinion, Jeff, if someone had a farm business resilience plan, would that form the basis of a plan that they could uh, take to a financial institution? Obviously, they're going to have to add some, um, you know, some material around uh, around business uh, and their financials. But if they were seeking, uh, you know, additional finance from a lender, um, would a if would a farm business resilience plan form the basis of something of a business plan that they could take to a lender? Yeah, I think it'd certainly help. Um, like you said, they'd need some financials to support it, but it'd help to provide. So say, for example, if they were looking to, in the example that I presented today, if they were looking to build a controlled environment greenhouse and they could demonstrate how that fits into their business mm. and how it was going to improve the resilience of their business through being able to continue to operate irrespective of the water supply, in addition to accessing different markets, um, then I think it'd be a really powerful tool. But once again, it'd have to be supported by uh, financials, yeah. which aren't included in the Farm Business Resilience Plan. Um, and it, it, they're still required for the, to access the loans. But in the Farm Business Resilience Plan, 
uh, template, we've acknowledged that in many cases, there'll be a requirement to do a full financial analysis, but we didn't make the want to make the process too cumbersome mm. for producers. So we haven't included it, but we're acknowledging that um, full financial analysis is often going to complement the farm business resilience plan. Good. I hope that thank answers you. Yeah, no, question, it does. Yeah, thank you very much. It's good. Uh, I've got a question here for you, I think, Cherie. If a producer has water equipment, um, it's been quoted uh, and ordered, but it hasn't been paid for or installed um, prior to approval of drought preparedness grant, um, would that uh, would that still be eligible? Um, yes. So if uh, water equipment quoted, of course, that would still be eligible. If it's been ordered and a tax invoice hasn't been generated, and a deposit hasn't been paid, then pretend, then yes, that would be fine too. But the minute a tax invoice gets generated, or um, that would be considered um, that that it has com been commenced. But ordered and quoted, certainly. Awesome, thank you. That's good clarification. That was one of the questions we had yesterday, so that's great. Another popular today, Sheree, mm -hmm. as always. Uh, breathe the drought preparedness grants if. If the uh, if the full fifty thousand dollars is used in one year, uh, perhaps for a number of different approved activities, is it correct that you uh, can't apply again um, within five years? That's correct. Yes. Yeah. So the fifty thousand dollars is stretched over a five year period. But you can utilise it for a number of different activities. Yep, up to yeah. fifty thousand dollars. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next question again, Cherie, is there a closing mm -hmm. date for the farm management grant or is it available uh, for a few years? There's no closing date at this point. So, yep, it's as open until we don't, until it's not. So there's no closing date just yet. <laughs> so I guess uh, for people on the webinar today, uh, the whole program um, and the, the, the grants and the financial assistance that is available uh, there will be a review uh, undertaken of the effectiveness. Um, so, and one of the things around effectiveness is uptake. Um, so if these loans aren't fit for purpose, if people aren't, uh, you know, utilising them, uh, well, it's highly likely then that they're not, <laughs> not going to be around for too long uh, because we're better off putting that money into something else that we may be able to, you know, uh, see greater uptake on. Uh, so that's a good, Clarity, Cherie, thank you for that. Uh, sorry, I'm just scrolling through the questions. Uh, the new assistance measures, Cherie, again, is it per property pick or per business? Sorry, I was on mute. Um, yeah, no, no that's yeah. per business, so per ABN, so per, per business. Okay. It's... Um, we must have a few more questions, people. Have we got? Yeah, here we go. That's thank you. Got a few more coming through. Uh, is there a is there a time period um, for people once they've been approved for for them to be able to draw down on the loan? Um, and if you complete one project at a time, are, are you able to get get that money incrementally, or do you yes. have to wait for all of it to be all of your project to be implemented? No, so um, there is a time period for drawdown. So um, it is usually looked at, you know, like uh, 30 to 90 days is pretty average for that. But of course, we also do understand that there are supply issues. We absolutely get that, um, you know, some of these things that we're wait, people are waiting months and months and months. So it's, it is absolutely looked at. The um, approval will when, when you get the approval, that will be um, outlined to you. And then if, the, if that needs to change, then it's really easy. It's very fluid because we do understand that those things. And one project at a time. Um, uh, you can apply more than once. So you could potentially have two applications on the run, but usually because um, the, you know, that, um, you know, it, it's usually, um, I, I guess each activity is often an expansion of the original one. <laughs> so I guess there wouldn't be, um, you know, too many instances where it's done, you know, 
at the same time for something. Yeah. But it, 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 case by case, it could happen. So thank you. Uh, what under Q Rider? I know there's a bit of conjecture about this across a, a range of different organisations, and I, so it's what the de, what's the definition of a primary producer? Um, yeah, I'm not even sure that the definition of the ATO <laughs> provides us with a hell of a lot of clarity around this. But for, from a Q Rider perspective, what's what is the definition, Cherie, that you would yep. look at? Yep, so the definition is exactly the same for all of the programs um, at this point, but it's um, a primary production entity, so the, it has to be a primary industry, and they have to receive more than 50% of their total gross income from that primary production entity and spend more than 50% of their labour on that primary production entity. That's it. Okay. So it does differ from the ATO and it does differ from the TMR and it does differ mm. from a whole heap of different places. But for this scheme and for our purpose, um, that is the definition. Excellent. Thank you. Just while we're waiting, uh, hopefully for a few more questions to come through from the audience, uh, I'd just like to let everyone know that um, post the webinar will actually be, uh, and this is one of the reasons why we like people to register, is that we'll actually forward everyone a survey um, and we appreciate frank and fearless feedback. Any feedback's good feedback, whether uh, you know, you've got some issues around the presentation and the content, um, whether Ted Parrish has got a bad head or had a head for radio, um, happy to take that on board. Um, we had some great feedback yesterday and that will help us actually shape the presentations moving forward or the webinars moving forward. I think as I indicated, we've got another couple of webinars coming up uh, tomorrow and on Friday. Um, and probably more, uh, well, not uh, just as important, we also hope to roll out uh, a number of regional forums in, in May uh, and June of this year. Um, we're still deciding on the localities, but we're probably hoping to get to probably 10 or a dozen regional localities. So if there's anything that um, you think about between now and then, um, you want to uh, you want to try and um, get your head around uh, a plan, the program, um, some of the assistance uh, that's available. Well, then please come along. Um, you know, make yourself known to us on the day. There'll be extensive uh, publication or publicising of where those events, when they're going to be held, um, put out through uh, a whole range of uh, different mediums. Uh, through QFF in this particular case, uh, and John and his organisations as well. Um, so we'd like to see as many people uh, come along and attend um, those forums as possible. So while we're waiting on a, here we go, we've got another, got another question. Uh, if you do, for an example, watering in different sections, i.e. a bore, then piping and troughs, etc. Will this be considered a commenced uh, project and be excluded? Or because it's been approved already, is it OK? Um, I'm going to guess that that one's for me again. Um, <laughs> so, so. Sorry, sorry. So if uh, watering different sections through like a, a new bore, a new piping and new troughs, um, or a, do you mean an expansion of an existing? It, because it, it sounds like an expansion of an existing. Yeah, like no, expan yep. yeah, expansion of an existing is not eligible. But uh, to drill a new bore, to get new irrigation systems, to new pushing, or like um, you know, like mm. if you you wanted to push out to a further paddock that doesn't get utilised, but um, then that would be considered. But ex but expanding or an existing system is not replacing an existing infrastructure isn't isn't included okay so let's go with the let's go with the second example then so if someone makes application for to put down a bore and, um, and that gets approved and then they look to expand on that um, you know through further reticulation um yeah that's that's all yeah. good yep. yes because that would be part of their their farm business resilience plan mm. so stage one or activity one is to drill the bore stage two is to then you know to, to, yeah, no, that would be fine. 
Great, thank you. Uh, I've got a question here. Is horse breeding classified as primary production? That's another question for me. Um, so uh, horse breeding is a um, agribusiness, but it's not a primary industry. But it's definitely an agricultural business, but not a primary industry. So is that eligible or not, essentially, no. if you're not? No. Yep. No. OK, thank you. All right, I think we're getting close to um, full time. A number of people have left the webinar. Uh, as I said, everyone, when we send out the survey, if there are some questions that you think about overnight, um, probably like me, you roll over in the middle of the night at 2.30 and go, geez, I wish I'd asked that. Um, please send us that feedback. Uh, we're more than we're more than happy to uh, to take any questions um, in an email from you uh, and we will uh, certainly respond to your email and provide you with some feedback or we'll obviously put you in touch with um, a relevant contact. Uh, please send those question, any questions that you may have outside of that um, through to that email address there, drought at daf.qld.gov.au. You can also phone through to our customer service centre on 13 25 23. And if you're looking for additional information, um, you can go to, uh, to DAF, to that um, web address there. Speak to Sharia Q Rider. She always loves talking to people in the bush. Um, or, as I said, attend one of our regional forums coming up in May or June. Uh, any closing comments from any of the panel participants? Ted, just one comment from uh, from me. Uh, if if we have producers out there that aren't part of our industry organisations, that doesn't exclude them from contacting QFF. We're more than happy to talk to anybody that's out there that's in primary production and would be interested in uh, some assistance. So in the first instance, we will also have our hands up through Kerry Battersby at Queensland Farmers Federation, QFF. Information will be at the bottom of this um, webinar, I believe. Thanks, Ted. Awesome. Good on you, John. Thank you. Cherie, you're all good. Any any closing parting pearls of wisdom for the audience? I have no pearls of wisdom, but <laughs> don't self-assess. Just give us a call. Yeah. No, that's a very that's a key one. Very, very critical. Yeah. Just uh, no harm in asking the question. Dave, you're all good, mate. Good, thanks, Ted. All righty, thanks, Dave. Jeff, any? Yeah, I just wanted to. There's been a lot of focus on QFF, which is excellent, and Kerry and the team at QFF are doing a wonderful job. Uh, just wanted to point out that there's also a dairy project that's coordinated and managed by Mark Bauer at Gatton um, with their partners, East Oz Milk and QDO. And they've been very proactive and they're out and about um, and have helped a number of, well, quite a number of producers already. So just wanted to let people know who may be interested in that industry that, that there is a dairy project and um, they've been very proactive and out and about and helped a lot of producers already. Excellent. Good on you, Jeff. Thank you for that clarity, Matt. That's great. Um, for those of you that joined late again, um, this webinar has been recorded, um, so if you uh, obviously as part of your registration, you'll be able to download that um, and access the recording. If there's anything that you missed today, as I said, there is a lot to take in. Um, please provide us with that feedback uh, when we um, send out an email to you um, with the with the survey. Uh, let people know that the uh, these webinars have been recorded um, and they can access it if they couldn't attend today. Um, they can access it through YouTube. And more importantly, thank you very much for attending. Um, it's been uh, it's been a good webinar. Thank you to all the speakers today for your time. Uh, we look forward to uh, to catching up again very soon. Thanks everyone. Have a great evening.